On Sunday the 8th of October, way back in 1871, the city of Chicago was ablaze. A very ferocious fire was quickly making its way through the city, totally destroying everything in its path, reducing everything to ash. People speculate that the fire began in the O'Leary family cottage after Mrs O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern that day and set the burn on fire, which was quickly engulfed by the flames and then started to spread on the wind towards the city. Most of the buildings in the city were made of wood. Even the buildings that looked as though they were made from stone were hiding a wooden frame underneath their fake exterior. The city was also made up of wooden sidewalks and the streets were covered in sawdust, which made the city of Chicago basically a tinderbox just waiting for a spark. When the fire started, the initial alarm somehow went unnoticed and by the time the fire brigade got the message, they were sent to the wrong location, which left the fire to spread out of control. On top of all this, the city was still suffering from a very serious drought, which left the earth and the plant life dry and scorched after a very hot summer, which didn't help stop the spread of the fire, which even crossed the river, moving on to consume most of the city. And the hellish flames reached high into the sky, lighting up the night whilst burning hot embers hopped from rooftop to rooftop. Even the intense heat that travelled on the wind was enough to ignite the wooden structures. The Chicago Fire Department had 185 firefighters and 17 horse-drawn steam pumpers which became useless when the city's water supply ran dry. Without water there wasn't much the fire brigade could do and the fire ravaged the city jumping from building to building. On the 9th of October the fire had started to burn itself out and in some ironic twist of fate the heavens opened up and it began to rain. But the fire still burned until the following day. The fire had destroyed a massive area of the city which spread 4 miles long and 1 mile wide and claimed the lives of approximately 300 people and left over a thousand people homeless and over 1700 buildings were reduced to a smouldering pile of ash. The news of the fire spread just as quickly as a fire itself, especially to the bigger cities, but out in the countryside news seemed to trickle in rather than flow. And over 900 miles away in the town of Gilmanton, the news did trickle down to the locals very slowly, who were both fascinated and horrified by the news of the fire that had killed so many people and laid waste to the city. But for one young resident of Gilmanton, the news of the fire was especially thrilling. Ten-year-old Herman Webster Mudgett took in every detail. The blaze, the terror, the destruction, the loss, and the death. Herman had a very dark side to him, even at the age of ten but he had become very efficient at hiding that dark side and not showing it to the outside world. As he absorbed every haunting detail from the great fire of Chicago, he imagined his parents trapped by the fire as her flesh blistered and burst and burned to the bone until there was only ash. And this thought comforted Herman, who we all know now as H.H. H. Holmes. Holmes was born Herman Webster Mudgett in Gilmanton, New Hampshire on May 16, 1861. He was the third child out of four born to Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. In the book Depraved, Holmes is described as a slightly built boy with blue eyes and brown hair. And according to eyewitnesses, Holmes was a quiet child, very bright and just seemed like a very ordinary, if not mature minded child. His father was a hard working man, if he wasn't out working as a painter then you may have found him farming. It's been said that he may have been a very strict man and Holmes would have often been at the receiving end of his violent outbreaks, whilst his mother stood by and allowed whatever course of punishment his father felt fit to dish out. And this is said to be where Holmes' hatred for his mother and father began. He detested the poor and couldn't wait to be his own man and leave his childhood behind. It may be safe to say that Holmes had known for some time that there was something different about him, something that separated him from the other children in the school. He was a bright child and an intelligent child, but deep down his side, something else festered. When Holmes was younger, there was an incident with a few school bullies that terrified Holmes, but also brought out a different side to him. Every day as Holmes made his way to our school, he had no option but to walk past the local doctor's surgery, which was always open for business. Holmes feared the doctors. He associated it with being sick and having to ingest a foul tasting medicine that the doctor prescribed. And he had also heard horror stories that the doctor liked to keep hacked off limbs and human heads that he preserved and stored inside the surgery. 
Holmes probably ran past the doctor's door rather than walked. He was afraid of the doctors, and to him, it was a stuff of nightmares. And this didn't go unnoticed by a few older schoolmates who decided that one day they would make him face his fears, but not for his own good. One particular day as Holmes walked past a doctor's surgery, he was grabbed by his older schoolmates and pulled kicking and screaming and crying into the building that he feared so much. His tormentors quickly brought him face to face with the doctor's display skeleton that stood eerily in the dark corner of the room, looking back at him with big dark voids where his eyes had once been, and as Herman sobbed and begged, the closer the bullies brought him to the face of death. And at that moment, the doctor returned from his errand, and the bullies dropped young Holmes and fled back into the street, as Holmes sat sobbing at the bony feet of the skeleton. And then he felt the fear subside and a fascination take its place, a fascination that would stay with him forever, a fascination for anatomy. And by 11 years old, young Holmes was already carrying out his own dissections on frogs and small reptiles. He liked to cut them open and see how they worked, and then he decided to move up to rabbits and cats, and eventually dogs. Young Holmes preferred his specimens to be alive as he sliced at their flesh with his blade and opened them up. And once the kill was complete, he liked to keep little mementos, certain body parts or skulls of the animals he slaughtered, and hide them in a small box. His own little secret. Holmes was a quiet child and did not show much interest in friendship, although he did have a friend at some point in his childhood named Tom. One day whilst he and Tom were exploring an abandoned house, Tom had an accident and fell to his death from the landing of the house. It is said that Holmes was later asked how he felt about his friend's death, to which he coldly replied, I prefer to be alone. It's not known for sure if Holmes had a hand in little Tom's death or not, but it is safe to say that he never felt any loss for his friend, and it's questionable if Holmes felt much for anybody at all. Years later, when Holmes reached 17 years of age, he met a young lady named Clara Lovering, and he enrolled in medical school soon after. In his college years, Holmes would often steal cadavers from the morgue or even graves and sell them to medical science, or create a false identity and take out life insurance on the corpse. He would then set up the dead bodies, recreating a deadly accident, mainly fires, so the body was unrecognisable, and then somehow claim life insurance by running a complicated scam. He may also have enjoyed experimenting with the bodies. It's safe to say that even though Holmes was despicable and murderous, he was also a very clever man. Deceiving people came very easy to Holmes, who had a very charming demeanour about himself. He was a smooth talker, and had the ability to wrap anyone around his little finger. And he certainly did this with young Clara who fell hook, line and sinker for his charms and it wasn't long before marriage and a child followed in 1880. But Holmes had no intention of letting anyone or anything tie him down and it wasn't long before he abandoned his wife and child, which in hindsight was a very good thing for Clara and her child. The next few years are very vague to say the least but it is believed that a few years later after his separation from his wife and child, Holmes moved to Moore's Forks in New York. Now, there are rumours that Holmes was seen with a young child in his company around this time who had later disappeared from the face of the earth and when he was questioned about what had become of the child, he insisted that he return the child to his home in Massachusetts. There's not much information regarding this, but it is believed that Holmes, who was someone who was not known to stay in one place for very long, later fled town. Holmes would later pop up in Philadelphia where he found work in a drugstore but he didn't stay here for long after the sudden death of a female customer by poisoning. She was given the wrong medication from Holmes, but Holmes claimed he was innocent and once again he fled the area, but this time he thought it was best to actually change his name from Mudgett. He didn't want the death of the woman and probably the child from New York hanging over his head and being associated with his name, and so he chose the name we all know him as today and the name I've been using throughout this story so far, H.H. H. Holmes. One hot day in July of 1886, a smartly dressed H.H. H. Holmes stepped over the threshold of Mr. and Mrs. Halton's drugstore, a very prosperous business on the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in Inglewood, Chicago. Since the Great Fire of Chicago, Inglewood had come a long way from its modest beginnings. After the fire, most of the people of Chicago fled to this little suburb on the city limits to restart their lives, and it wasn't long before the population multiplied and the location flourished. H.H. H. Holmes knew this too well, and it was for this reason he visited the Holton's pharmacy that day. 
Holmes was always thinking ahead, always thinking of the next scam, with no concern of the people's lives he ruined or ended. Like I said, the Holton's drugstore was a very prosperous business. It was always busy and full of custom. Whatever your ailment was, Holton's pharmacy was sure to stock some kind of elixir or pill, ointment or herbal concoction to treat your illness. But recently, the busy trade was proving too much for Mr. and Mrs. Holton, who were quite frankly finding it hard to cope. Mr. Holton was in the latest stages of suffering through prostate cancer, something that the many glass bottles of medicine and pills in the store could not cure. He lay in his bed on the upper floor of the store whilst Mrs. Holton struggled downstairs with the demanding crowds that were always coming through the door as she came closer and closer to collapse and losing her husband to cancer. Now, I refuse to believe that Holmes did not see this as a perfect opportunity to turn on his deceitful charms, and he did just that. As Holmes approached Mrs. Holton, the first thing that she would have noticed was that this young man was very smartly dressed, with flashes of gold coming from his cufflinks, and he was very well groomed, with a perfectly neatly trimmed moustache sitting on a handsome face below a fetching fedora hat. Holmes knew how to put on a good show and present himself well and he knew how to sell himself also. Holmes introduced himself and made sure that he included that he had graduated medical school and that he had experience with working in a chemist, of course leaving out the part about poisoning a customer. He proceeded to inquire if there was a vacancy at the drugstore that he could fill. To Mrs. Holton, Holmes must have seemed like a gift from the gods, and she hired him on the spot. Holmes was a natural behind the counter, organising stock, filling prescriptions, and he was also a natural at charming the customers, who quickly come to think highly of Holmes, especially the female customers, who puzzled at the fact that Holmes was still a bachelor and hadn't taken a wife. Little did they know that under a different name, he was still indeed married. Over the coming months, Holmes had completely gained the trust of the community and Mrs. Holton. He had gradually worked his way from serving customers and filling prescriptions to handling the accounts of the business, and after the death of Mr. Holton, that may or may not have been at the hands of Holmes, he was pretty much running the store. As a tired Mrs. Holton, I'd simply let Holmes take the reins. But of course, Holmes didn't want to be the employee for much longer. He wanted to own the business. One day, Holmes offered to buy the store from Mrs. Holton, and she quickly agreed. After all, who better to sell the business to than this young man who came to the rescue in her hour of need? She asked only one thing of Holmes, that she be allowed to remain in the apartment above the shop. Holmes agreed, and the relevant paperwork was signed, and the deal was made that Holmes would make multiple payments to Mrs. Holton for the purchase of the store. And with that, a gold letter sign went up above the door of the drugstore, informing the customers that the Holtons were all news. H.H. H. Holmes was now the owner of the store. Of course, Holmes had absolutely no intention of paying Mrs. Holton, and each month he made up some kind of excuse not to pay her, something he would do again and again in future scams. It became clear to Mrs. Holton that she had been tricked by Holmes, his charms had won over her trust, and now she may never see her money. Mrs. Holton gave Holmes so many chances to pay the money that was owed, and after multiple failures to do so, she seeked legal action to force some money from Holmes by means of the law. Now, there are versions of this story that state that Mrs. Holton dropped the suit against Holmes and stayed in the area and lived out the rest of her life. Although, it is also rumoured that for some unknown reason, Mrs. Holton mysteriously vanished. She disappeared. No one knew where she had gone or why she had disappeared. And when her loyal customers, who had known her for so long, inquired where her whereabouts were, Holmes simply said she had moved away. Whether Mrs. Holton met her demise at the hands of H.H. H. Holmes is unclear, but one thing that we do know is that it wasn't long before Holmes moved his belongings into the second floor apartment above the drugstore. Holmes now had a business that was making a nice little profit, and to make things even better, he didn't have many outgoings. Holmes loved money, and he hated to part with it. And besides, if his next part of his master plan was going to succeed, he would need all the money he could get. For across the road from the pharmacy, on the corner of 63rd and Wallace, Holmes had his eye on a big plot of land. He had actually had his eye on this plot of land for quite some time. Holmes was always thinking ahead. He had grand ideas for this plot of land where he planned to build his very own three-storey building. On the ground floor of his grand building, he would create a row of shops that he would rent out to merchants as well as running some of the businesses himself. On the third level, Holmes would create many apartment rooms for anyone wanting to visit the city of Chicago. 
But on the second floor, there would be multiple apartment rooms. Some were genuine rooms, and some would have a very different purpose. It was like a labyrinth to get around, full of twists and turns, built in a bizarre and complex manner, with maze-like hallways and misleading doorways. An airtight chamber specially designed to be the last room his guests would ever see as they gasped for the final breath and specially built gas chambers as well as grease chutes that go all the way down to the dark basements where he intended to keep a medical table that would more resemble a butcher's block. This was Holmes's dream, his masterpiece, his murder castle. Holmes was now moving up in the world. He was now the proud owner of a very profitable pharmacy and he was seen as a respectable gentleman in the area and yet he remained a bachelor. In December of 1886, Holmes was away on a business trip to Minneapolis. Whether it was an actual business trip or something more sinister was unclear, but it was in Minneapolis where he met Murta Z. Belknap. It wasn't long before Holmes had turned on his charms and won over the heart of Murta, who fell head over heels for Holmes. And by January of 1887, the already married Holmes and Murta were wed. After the wedding, Murta returned with Holmes to his pharmacy back in Chicago. Any customer that entered Holmes' pharmacy would have seen the married couple running the shop together, and it was clear to see that the quiet young blonde lady was totally content and slightly enchanted by her loving husband. But like most women in Holmes' life, it wasn't long before he started to lose interest, and the clinginess became a problem. Holmes probably thought she was now cramping his style. With his bride by his side, he was no longer in any position to turn on his flirtatious charms. He was indeed a ladies' man, and had a way with women, and with his wife by his side, he was not able to act out on his carnal desires. She may have also been getting in the way of him planning out his further endeavours, and he decided that she needed to exist more in the background rather than up front, and it wasn't long before Murta would be spending less time in the pharmacy and more time in the back or doing house chores. It wasn't long before Murta started to feel more and more neglected, and it was clear that Holmes had simply lost interest as he flirted with most of the females that crossed the threshold of his shop. Even though the relationship was hopeless, Murta hung on to hope. In those days, divorce was frowned upon heavily, so bringing the marriage to a close was a choice she wanted to avoid if possible. Another reason she could not end the marriage was because of the baby growing in her womb. Murta decided that she would stay married to Holmes no matter what, after all. He had totally won her over. She loved him, even if he had grown so far away from her, and the only course of action she could take was to move back in with her parents, who would help her bring up the child. And Holmes quite happily agreed to this, and provided financial support and promised to pay regular visits to his wife and child. The fact that Murta and her child made it out alive suggests that Holmes may have had a sliver of whatever his version of love may have been for his second wife. Or, it was simply the easiest course of action to make. After all, other women in Holmes' future would not be so lucky. Nevertheless, Holmes was once again living alone, and Holmes liked this. He was now free to make his plans. Plans for something horrific. By the summer of 1888, the same year Jack the Ripper was slashing the throats of women in the streets of Whitechapel, Holmes had managed to get hold of a lease for the land across the street. He could at last start planning his three-story monstrosity. And although as profitable as the pharmacy was, Holmes still didn't have the required funds to build what he had in mind, but that never stopped him before. By the fall of 1888, construction had started across the street on the vacant plot of land, and his plans would have this three-storey building take up the entire plot of land which was 50 by 162 feet. When finished, it would be quite an impressive building, if not a little hard on the eyes. It was not an attractive building at all. In fact, in my opinion, it was quite ugly. But the inside would be even more bizarre, with its maze-like corridors and secret chutes and questionable rooms. Holmes planned out every inch of the castle, with piping that would run into most of the bedrooms with a control tap in Holmes's office, which he could turn on and pump gas into the bedrooms after he'd locked in his customer or victim from the outside. There were also secret sliding walls and peepholes, and the grease chutes I mentioned earlier went straight down to the basement where Holmes kept his acid tank and quicklime vats and a dissecting table. This was a great way for Holmes to dispose of the corpses without walking the corridors of the castle. But of course, Holmes did not wish to raise any suspicion as to what it was he was actually building. It wasn't only a row of shops to hire and a hotel, it was also a place he could trap, torture and kill. 
something his pharmacy across the road wasn't built for. But when building from scratch, Holmes could plan out exactly what he needed. But he would need someone to build it for him. But to avoid suspicion, it couldn't just be one team of builders, it would have to be multiple builders. Luckily there was always someone in need of work and carpenters and men who offered to work some hard labour were never far away. So to avoid suspicions, Holmes would offer work to most who came calling and he would give the worker a small part of the building to complete. And when the small part of the building was complete, Holmes would simply say their work wasn't up to scratch and fire them on the spot before bringing in another man who was desperate for work to take his place. This was a way of bringing in fresh eyes that did not see the complexity of the finished project. The only person who had a complete vision of the build was Holmes himself. Because of the lengths Holmes took to keep the suspicions away from his build, it took over a year and a half to complete, and during that time, Holmes had hired over 500 workers. This also saved Holmes a great deal of money after telling the workers that payment would only come on completion of their jobs, and then simply accuse them of doing a shoddy job and fire them on the spot, sending them away with no pay. But of course the work that was done on Holmes's building was to good quality, if not a little bizarre looking, and Holmes had no intention of ever paying a wage if he could get away with not doing so. But Holmes's swindling ways didn't stop at construction, he would also furnish the entire build on credit and simply not pay a dime, and when the furnishers appeared to claim their money, Holmes would simply make up some kind of lie, turn on his charms and send away the debt collector content that the money would follow the following week, and of course it didn't, he had no intention to do so. One particular example of this, which is my favourite, was when Holmes purchased a walk-in safe. Once Holmes had the safe delivered, he wasted no time in having whatever poor worker was under his employ that day install it into the third floor of the castle, and then he actually had a room built around the safe, completely fixing it and enclosing it into the building. It was now totally trapped in this room, and there was no way to bring it out without causing some kind of damage to the structure of the building, and Holmes knew this. He was always thinking ahead and due to the fact that he had absolutely no intention of paying a dime for the massive safe, he thought it was necessary to ensure that it was fully fitted right away. And of course, after months of non-payments by Holmes, the safe company decided that they were wasting their time asking for late payments and simply decided they would take back the safe. And when they came to collect, Holmes informed them that they could indeed take the safe away, that was no problem. However. If they caused any kind of damage to his property, he would sue them for as much as he could. And so the safe company thought it was actually safer to take a loss and leave the safe where it was rather than be slapped with a lawsuit. So they simply walked away, wrote off the debt, and Holmes had gained himself an incredibly expensive safe, absolutely free of charge. The swindles came easy to Holmes. He was a cunning deviant who could charm a snake if he needed to. But even himself could not hold at bay the number of angry workers that were demanding money from him for work they had provided on the castle. This is where a gentleman named Benjamin Pitesell came into the story. Benjamin was the father of six children, Desa Jane Pitesell, Etta Alice Pitesell, Rosa Nell Pitesell, Howard Robert Pitesell, Noble Neville Pitesell who sadly passed away just before his second birthday, and Horton Monroe Pitesell. And he doted on his children and his wife Kerry. And it's safe to say that Benjamin did everything he could to put food on the table for his large family. In his early life, Benjamin was a good looking man, a working man who was not afraid to get his hands dirty. But Benjamin also had a weakness for the drink, something he could use to drown his sorrows and subdue them. Over time, the drink slowly destroyed the version of the man he once was. And the numerous bar fights he got into didn't help his physical appearance, which included a prominent broken nose and missing teeth that had either rotted or been punched from his mouth. Benjamin also had several run-ins with the law, but his devotion to provide for his family always shined through. And in November 1889, Benjamin circled an ad in the local newspaper. The ad was asking for experienced carpenters to assist in the construction of a brand new building in Inglewood, and the applicant should ask for Dr. H. H. Holmes. Benjamin went for the interview and indeed got the job, but unlike the countless other workers that helped with the construction of the castle, Holmes possibly saw the weakness in Benjamin's eyes and went about exploiting it to his will. Starting out as a labourer, Benjamin quickly became Holmes' partner in crime to some extent. He became a sort of protector, his goon you might say. Holmes had him exactly where he wanted him, at his side 
whenever recalled. Pytzell would go on helping Holmes in multiple unsavoury exploits, not quite knowing exactly how evil Holmes actually was. And before the end of the story, Pytzell will play a very large part in the downfall of H.H. H. Holmes. But we will come back to this later. With the castle now complete, Holmes was ready to sell the pharmacy across the road that he had acquired or swindled from the Hortons a few years back. And it wasn't long before he had an interesting buyer, a gentleman named A.L. Jones who had travelled to Chicago with a brand new wife and a substantial amount of inheritance. A.L. Jones was invited to view the pharmacy and what he saw must have impressed him very much. The shop was absolutely heaving with customers. It was his intention to become a successful businessman and start a happy family. And what better business to buy than this very busy pharmacy in a prime location? And more importantly, there was no competition. However, unknown to A.L. Jones, Holmes had actually paid off the customers to fill up the shop on the day of the viewing to make the pharmacy look even more profitable than it actually was. And with that, A.L. Jones, who was very impressed with what he saw, made up his mind and shook Holmes's hand. And in July of 1890, the business was sold. However, prior to completion, Holmes was stripped the store of stock and furnishings. Anything that was worth anything was simply taken away. So when A.L. Jones moved into the shop, he was shocked to see that not everything was included in the sale as he first thought, but still, he and his wife persevered at making his new business work. A few weeks later, A.L. Jones peered out of his store window, across the road at the castle, to see a grand delivery of shiny new store fittings, beautifully painted cabinets, and a beautiful large counter that would hold a cash register. The delivery men carried the furnishings into a vacant storefront on the ground floor of the castle. It wasn't long before a freshly varnished sign went up above the new store, which read H.H. H. Holmes Pharmacy. Everything about Holmes' new pharmacy was elegant, with marble worktops, high ceilings, and a shiny tile floor that you could see your face in. And it was stocked with every kind of medicine, ointment, and elixirs you could ever think of. And it wasn't long before the newlyweds in the now shabby looking pharmacy that simply couldn't compete with Holmes' new pharmacy across the road went out of business and they lost every dime of their money and eventually moved away from Chicago. Holmes' new pharmacy wasn't the only business Holmes ran on the ground floor of his castle. In fact, he had his hand in many different business ideas. This man loved money, possibly more than killing, and would also become an inventor, convincing people that his inventions worked, when in fact, the man was lying through his teeth. This included a machine he invented that turned water into an illuminating gas. Of course, it was all fibs. Holmes would pour water into one side of the contraption, and as the water somehow changed to gas and came out of a pipe on the other side, Holmes would then strike a match to prove that the water had indeed turned to gas and a flame was produced. However, he had simply fitted an actual gas pipe to the contraption, but he fooled everybody, and the investors offered Holmes £10,000 to bring his machine to the market. But Holmes would eventually be found out about this con, but once again, he simply got away with it. But it is impressive that he initially fooled so many people, because that's what Holmes was good at, lying and cheating and charming, and they all went hand in hand. Holmes always had an attractive young lady behind the counter in his pharmacy, and quite often he would strike up a relationship with the assistant, a romantic relationship, after he made a fall for him. But of course it wouldn't be long before Holmes got bored, and decided it was time for his assistant to disappear, and a new one would simply take her place. It is speculated that the previous employees may have met their end on Holmes' torture rack or his butcher block, then burned in the kiln Holmes had installed in the basement that burned at 3000 degrees and burned so hot it could be used for making glass. In fact, that is what Holmes told the gentleman that installed the furnace that he intended to make windows. However, his intentions were to burn evidence and the heat was capable of burning bones into nothing. As well as a very lucrative hotel and pharmacy that Holmes ran, he also had his hands in a few other businesses. And one of these businesses was a jewellery store. And sometime in 1890, an ad went into the paper. Holmes needed someone to run the jewellers for him. As you can imagine, with all his responsibilities and swindling and God knows what else he was up to at the time, he probably had very little time to spur. A gentleman named Ned Connor answered the ad and the position was given to him right away. After all, his experience at being a jeweller and a watchmaker made him perfect for the position. 
You see, Ned once owned his very own little shop in Davenport, which did him okay, but to say he was successful was not a word that people who knew him described him as. In fact, poor Ned was said to have very little about him. It's true, he was a good watch repair man and knew about his trade, but he lacked something about his character, and luck always seemed to sidestep him. He was a timid man and had very little self-worth and confidence, so it came to a great shock to all who knew him when he managed to charm a young lady named Julia Smythe. Julia had an attractive figure and she stood six feet tall with chestnut hair and deep green eyes. She was actually the personification of the feminine ideal of attractiveness in that time period and many men would have given anything to be with her. But Julia didn't want any man. She fell for Ned as soon as she laid eyes on him and to many who knew her, it came as a shock. The pair just didn't seem to match. She was very ambitious and used confidence, whereas Ned, well, Ned didn't. It's not to say that Ned was not a hard worker and he was said to be a very nice man who did have ambitions but he lacked little charm and confidence to make his dreams take off. But Julia saw something in him that others simply didn't and by early in 1880 Julia and Ned became man and wife. However, the union of the two lovebirds did not improve Ned's business skills as it became clear that the store was not doing so good and now money was tight and the cash register was rarely opened. After a short while, tensions arose between the two, and arguments were frequent. But in 1882, Julia told Ned the happy news that they were having a baby. Things must have seemed like they were changing for the better, and maybe the addition of a son or daughter could bless her marriage. But the pregnancy turned out to be anything but a blessing. The child was a stillborn. But life goes on, and Ned and Julia felt that life in Davenport was never going to grant them happiness and so they packed up their belongings and headed for greener pastures. But for the next seven years they moved between multiple different towns, trying their hardest to make a life for themselves. But success was always just out of reach. However, in 1887 Julia gave birth to a baby girl named Pearl. Maybe now everything was starting to look up. Maybe now the future held promise. Two years later, Ned, Julia and Pearl would arrive in Chicago and it wasn't long before he answered the ad placed by H.H. Holmes and got the job. Ned's luck seemed to finally be on the up, when in fact it was the most unlucky decision he had ever made, especially for Julia and Pearl. Ned was given the manager's position and $12 a week as well as room and board for his little family up on the third floor of the castle. Unfortunately, over the next couple of months, Holmes became infatuated with Julia, and Holmes at once turned on his deviant charms to win her over. If Holmes was going to make Julia his mistress, he decided he needed her much nearer to him on a day-to-day -day basis, and so he actually fired his pharmacy shop assistant and brought in Julia in her place. And eventually, he won Julia over. After all, her marriage was already on the verge of collapse and it had been for some time. And all of a sudden, Julia was getting attention of a charming, successful businessman. Everything her husband was not. The affair became obvious to all the locals who entered the store. That is, apart from Ned himself, who went on oblivious or turning a blind eye in order to keep his position of manager. But eventually, even Ned couldn't ignore the blatant affair that his wife was having with Holmes right under his nose. And when he confronted her and gave her the choice of him or Holmes, Julia picked Holmes and poor Ned moved out of the castle and found employment elsewhere and eventually left Chicago with no wife or child, dragging his crushed dreams along with him. After a few months, Holmes once again started to grow bored of Julia. Maybe it was because the challenge to take a married woman away from her husband was now complete and over. Or maybe it was because she had gone from being a mistress to insisting that she had more to do in his life and business. But if it was anything that put the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, was a reveal that Julia was now pregnant and Holmes was the father. So of course, it was now necessary to marry Julia. Holmes was already finding Julia and her daughter Pearl a massive inconvenience. So the inclusion of a newborn child and another wedding was something Holmes could not allow. And so Holmes went about making Julia think that he was going to marry her, but he made her a word that he already had a daughter and he would now be adopting Pearl as his own, and he was not ready to father another child. And so marriage was on the table, but if Julia wanted to be Mrs. Holmes, she would have to agree to an abortion that Holmes claimed he had experience in from his medical days. 
Of course, Julia was horrified by this, but Holmes always managed to get his own way, and he had a way of manipulating people and getting what he wanted. And so, Julia agreed to the abortion, and Holmes picked a date to extract the fetus. December 24th. And so, on Christmas Eve night, Holmes told Julia it was time. But before the procedure could take place, Pearl needed to go to bed. So Holmes scooped her up and carried her towards her bedroom, stopping off at the office to grab a cloth and a glass bottle of liquid. He placed Tiny Pearl into her bed and poured the liquid onto the cloth and held it tightly over the child's face as she fought back, spasmed and eventually went limp. He returned to Julia and showed her that her child was safely tucked into bed and fast asleep. Little did she know, Pearl was now dead. He then led Julia towards a secret staircase, a staircase that she had never seen before, and they both descended down to the cellar where Holmes' operating table awaited Julia. Julia and her daughter Pearl were never seen again. Not long after, a gentleman named Charles M. Chappell, who was in Holmes' employ, was asked to accompany Holmes to the second floor of the castle. He had a job for him. You see, Chapel was actually very good at articulating and mounting human skeletons, and he had learned this skill at a medical college years ago. When Holmes learned of this, he decided that Chapel was a man he could use. Holmes led Chapel into the room on the second floor of the castle. Inside the room was a table holding a partially dissected woman who was around six foot tall, the same size as Julia. Her features were unrecognisable as her face had been split and the skin had been peeled off the entire body. Of course, at the time, Chappell thought everything was perfectly above board and legal. After all, he knew Holmes was a doctor and was probably going through an autopsy. But he later described the body of the woman to looking like a jackrabbit that had been skinned by splitting the skin down the face and rolling it back off the entire body. The body was already badly mutilated and Holmes paid Chappell $36 to strip the corpse clean of any flesh and articulate the skeleton. And when the work was done, Holmes sold the skeleton to a medical college and made a nice profit of $200, which in today's money I believe is somewhere around $5,000. Eventually a surgeon named Pauling obtained the skeleton and proudly displayed it in his very own office, totally unaware that it was the skeleton of Julia, who was murdered in the bowels of H.H. H. Holmes' castle along with her child on Christmas Eve. In 1879, a Dr. Leslie Keeley announced that he had found a cure for alcoholism, but Keeley treated alcoholism as a disease rather than an addiction or a dependence, and according to him, this disease could be cured with his groundbreaking procedure, also known as the Gold Cure. In order to rid yourself of alcohol disease, all you needed to do was book yourself into the institute and treatment would begin, which was four injections of bichloride of gold four times a day as well as other tonics. The patients were placed in hotels or local houses that also offered a spa-like experience, and after four weeks, the patient would be released a new person, so to speak. It is thought that the injections contained gold salts and vegetable oils and even ammonia, but Keeley always kept the ingredients of the injections a secret and close to his chest. And because of this, his miracle cure was always met with scrutiny from the medical community, who claimed it was too good to believe that a cure for alcoholism could be administered and seen through to completion in only four weeks. Nevertheless, Keeley's business flourished and for every patient he cured, he would then employ them to go out and promote the miracle cure themselves. And Keeley's slogan spoke for itself, which was, Drunkenness is a disease and I can cure it. One man who was drawn to the idea of the gold cure was Benjamin Peitzel, H.H. Holmes's right-hand man. Benjamin realised that the drink was slowly destroying him and something needed to be done. Or maybe Holmes thought it was best to rid this man of his alcoholism once and for all. After all, he relied on Benjamin and he was no good to him drunk or hungover. The procedure cost a cool $100, which for the day was quite expensive, possibly a sum of money that was out of reach for a man like Benjamin. So it is likely that Holmes paid for Ben to visit the institute. Whether he was looking out for Ben or merely saw an opportunity to try and discover the ingredients of the gold cure for himself and make up his own version of the miracle cure is not entirely known. What is known is that Ben books himself into the institute in March of 1882 and by April of 1882 he had returned a new man, a sober man. It would seem that the gold cure worked. Well, maybe not, because it wasn't long before Ben started to once again crave the drink, and after a while he fell back off the wagon that he briefly climbed back upon. However, Ben found it hard to forget a woman he had met at the institution, 
who checked him into the programme. No doubt he wasted no time in telling Holmes about the beautiful woman sat behind the desk of the Institute, as men tend to do. Ben informed Holmes with much enthusiasm about the 24-year-old tall blonde young lady that was a sight to behold, with glowing soft skin and an innocence about her. This lady was called Emmeline Sigrand. At this news, Holmes, who we all know now likes the ladies, wasted no time in visiting the Institute. Benjamin had already told Emmeline all about Holmes when he was being treated over the four weeks, and how he worked for such an important man, no doubt trying to impress her for himself. And because of this, in a way, she probably already felt familiar with the man she had never met. And it wasn't long before Holmes once again activated his charms and he won over Emmeline. Initially, he did this by writing to her and offering her a job at the castle as his private secretary, a great way to keep her close. And then he offered her a salary of $18 a week, a massive 50% increase over the wage Dr. Keeley was paying at the Institute. So how could she say no? As soon as she took the position, Holmes wasted no time in seducing her with expensive gifts, fancy dinners in fancy restaurants, and expensive trips to the theatre, as well as meeting for pleasant strolls through the park. And it wasn't long before he had totally won her over, and they had become an item. But bear in mind, Holmes was still married to Myrta, who his customers often inquired about, as well as the first wife that no one knew of. But it was clear to see that Holmes and his secretary were now an item, and by the end of 1892 she expected Holmes to marry her, and he actually agreed to this and encouraged her to write the addresses of her closest relatives on 12 clear envelopes, and he would have some professional marriage announcements printed up, and he would post them out. But he insisted that she refer to him as Robert E. Phelps, and she did so. As she sat there writing out the addresses one at a time, feeling like the happiest woman in the world, she had no idea that Holmes had already decided that she was going to die. Holmes was going to kill her. There are many theories as to why Holmes decided to kill Emmeline. It could have been that she simply knew too much of his business, or maybe, to him, it was the easiest course of action. But I think Holmes just simply wanted to kill. Maybe the urge had become too strong to ignore after the excitement and novelty had gradually worn off. Sometime during December of 1892, Holmes asked Emmeline to search for some important business papers that he kept inside the walk-in safe. And so Emmeline walked into the safe and proceeded to search for the papers in question, and while she was preoccupied, Holmes pushed the door shut and turned the wheel and locked Emmeline inside the safe. It is said that at first Emmeline was simply baffled as to what was going on. She had absolutely no reason to suspect Holmes of anything sinister and as cruel as what he had planned for her. She gradually started to realise that Holmes was not going to open the door and she was now trapped in here and was finding it increasingly harder to breathe and the acid that Holmes had covered the floor with was actually speeding up the process as the deadly fumes mixed in with the small amount of earth that was in the safe. Outside, Holmes listened intently as she went from demanding the door be opened to pleading that the door be opened and then to pure terror and panic as she realised she was going to die as she choked on the foul mixture of fumes in the air, and then she pushed with her feet against the door in one more final attempt to free herself. The acid that had been placed on the floor burned a perfect copy of her foot onto the steel of the safe door. Whilst Emmeline slowly and painfully choked to death on the floor of the safe, Holmes undid his trousers and pleasured himself over and over until he was satisfied and then relaxed content. Not long after Emmeline's death, Holmes took the addressed envelope she had filled in days before, stating that she had wed a gentleman named Robert Phelps. This was to make her family believe that Emmeline had simply ran away with another man. And once again, Holmes paid once more for the flesh to be stripped from Emmeline's dead body and the skeleton professionally at. In 1893, the World's Columbian Exposition, or as many came to know it as simply the Chicago World Fair, was being held in Chicago to celebrate the 400-year anniversary of Christopher Columbus and his voyage into the New World in 1492. The fair covered a massive 690 acres and brought together 46 nations who all participated in the fair and welcomed over 27 million visitors over its six-month run. This World's Fair was a very important event and in a way it represented Chicago's rebirth after the Great Fire, but the fur also saw some truly revolutionary inventions and showcasing some brand new styles in architecture and introducing some new cultural ideas. 
If you could step back in time and attend the fur, here are a few of the attractions you could have witnessed with your own eyes. You could have taken a ride on the world's very first Ferris wheel that stood an impressive 264 feet high. You could have seen life-size reproductions of Christopher Columbus's three ships, which were actually built in Spain and then sailed over to America for the world fur. You'd have also seen the world's first moving walkway, where visitors to the fur could either sit or stand as a moving walkway took them directly to the casino. You could have also witnessed for the very first time the invention of the dishwasher, the zipper, the elevator and the very first voice recording, as well as so much more. And homes have been preparing for the world fur for quite some time, and when the world fur eventually arrived in Chicago, it is said that homes had every room booked almost every night. Now, it is not entirely sure how many people met their end in the murder castle over the period of the world fur being in Chicago, but one pulp magazine suggested that Holmes may have had over 200 victims over the time of the world fur. Although this is highly unlikely, it's rumoured that maybe 50 tourists that stayed at the castle disappeared from the face of the earth and were never seen again, and they probably met their end as he pumped gas into their rooms as they slept. In fact, his staff would later comment on how many female guests simply ran away leaving their belongings behind, and Holmes simply didn't look concerned that he'd been cheated out of his room fee, when in fact it was the hotel guests that were cheated out of their lives, and then thrown down the grease chutes that made their way to the dark basement, where Holmes kept his dissecting table. In 1893, Holmes was once again on the prowl for another mistress, and it wasn't long before he had another woman in his employ. This lady was named Minnie Williams and Holmes hired her as his personal secretary once again, and of course it was not long before they were lovers. Unlike Holmes, past conquest Minnie wasn't in the same calibre. She was described as naive and not very bright, but pleasant, short-legged and plump. In the book Deviant she is described as an overgrown baby. It's safe to say she wasn't Holmes' usual type, but nonetheless they were a couple. In fact, Minnie had one very alluring detail about her that Holmes could not resist. You see, when Minnie was younger, herself and her younger sister Nanny were adopted by two separate uncles. The uncle who took in Minnie was quite well off and her life with him was very comfortable, and money was never an issue. But when Minnie turned 23, her uncle sadly passed away, but left her some property in his will that was valued at over $40,000, so in hindsight it became painfully clear what it was that Holmes wanted. He wasn't interested in Minnie, he was interested in what she had. You see, at this particular time, Holmes was in a massive amount of debt. Although it never bothered him in the past, his creditors had now actually banded together and were applying a well-deserved amount of pressure to pay. So it wasn't long before Holmes worked his charms once again and somehow persuaded Minnie to somehow sign over the property to him. He obviously had her unconditional love and trust and she was a very kind woman, and Holmes knew exactly how to exploit kindness. Now, seeing as Holmes already had the property signed over to him, this is the part where Holmes would usually kill his victim and send her flying down the grease chute to the basement. But there was another problem he needed to deal with first. You see, Minnie had started a new relationship with her sister, Nanny, who went living with the other uncle and she quickly became a fixture in her life, which meant that Nanny knew about Holmes. Minnie had spoken fondly of him in letters to Nanny on many occasions, and this presented a problem. There could be absolutely no loose ends in Holmes's plans, so this meant that Holmes had decided that Minnie and Nanny both had to die, and so Holmes went about putting his evil plan in motion. One day, Holmes suggested that Minnie invite Nanny and they would all enjoy a day out at the World Fur, and so she did, and they actually visited the fur a few times during Nanny's visit. And it was during this time that Holmes was actually trying his best to win Nanny over, who was apparently at first rather suspicious of Holmes, but it didn't take long before he had her complete trust. On their last visit to the World Fur, Holmes suggested that Minnie return home and rest, and he would take Nanny to the castle, and he was sure around the building. And so Minnie returned home and Nanny went with Holmes as he showed her around the mind-bending confusing passageways of the castle. And when the tour was over, Holmes requested that Nanny help him with some very important papers he needed to get from the walk-in safe. As he led her into the safe, he quickly shut the door and locked Nanny inside, where she suffocated to death. Later, Holmes would return to Minnie, obviously without Nanny, and when Minnie inquired where her sister was, he told her that she was waiting back at the castle, and they were going to collect her on the way to dinner. An excited Minnie quickly got dressed, and then was escorted to the castle by Holmes to join her sister. 
That evening, Holmes dined alone, as Minnie suffocated back at the castle in his walk-in safe. It wasn't long before Holmes had once again met another woman who he quickly became engaged to once again. In fact, he had been visiting this woman whilst courting Minnie Williams, but at the time his attention was entirely on Minnie and her inheritance. But now, Minnie was out of the picture, along with her sister, and his attention was now fully on his new love interest, Miss Georgina York. 23-year-old Georgina was a blonde-haired young woman who was said to be very charming with blue eyes. As we know, Holmes was already married, and so he made up some extravagant story telling Georgina that both his parents were dead, which was a lie. He told her that his siblings had also died, and that his mother's brother had looked after him and become his only remaining relative, which was also a lie. And his uncle was to leave him all of his fortune in his will, but to do so he wanted Holmes to take his name Henry Mansfield Howard, which was a lie. This was a great way to avoid suspicion when he eventually married again. Holmes was very adept at spinning the perfect lie, and lies flowed from him so easily it was like second nature. As well as the wedding, Holmes had more pressing things on his mind, mainly the amount of debt he had mounted up over the years, and now his creditors were pressing him and moving him for payment. And just like Holmes always eventually became bored of the women in his life, he had also become bored of the murder castle, and he decided it was time to bring this part of his life to a close and move on to other devious swindles, crimes and murders. And so, on a crisp, cold night in October, Holmes paid a man to set the castle alight. And so, the top floor and the second floor went up into flames. The top floor was totally destroyed, and the second floor partially damaged. But the row of shops underneath remained untouched. Holmes had actually taken out multiple insurance policies against fire, and he intended to claim the money, which would have been a payout of $25,000. However, upon inspection, it was discovered that the fire looked very suspicious. As well as this, Holmes had actually raised a few red flags against himself with his past swindles. Ultimately, the insurance company refused to pay Holmes a dime, and Holmes simply walked away with no punishment. He had escaped the law once again. But Holmes was still in a lot of debt, and his creditors had actually hired a lawyer to get their money from Holmes. And if the money wasn't paid, a warrant would be made for his arrest. It was around this time that Holmes had come up with another scam. It would take a lot of planning and plotting. For this scam, Holmes would require the help of his goon, Benjamin Pycell. Holmes explained that he planned to take out a life insurance policy on Benjamin's life and stage his death. He would then acquire a cadaver and badly disfigure it so it could pass off as Benjamin. And when Benjamin agreed, Holmes insured Benjamin's life to a total sum of $10,000. And with that, Holmes and his new wife left Chicago along with Benjamin, who bid farewell to his wife and children for now, and they were next seen in Texas. The inclusion of Georgina, who was now Holmes' wife, was a complication, but Holmes simply lied through his teeth. He was good at lying, and she bought everything he said, completely trusting in her loving husband. He was making her believe that he was finalising some important business deals and taking possession of the ranch left to him by his loving, non-existent uncle that he had dreamt up when in reality he was there to claim the property he swindled out of Minnie, his dead fiancée, as well as planning the complicated life insurance scam him and Benjamin planned to see through. However, Holmes did like to pull off different scams whenever the opportunity arose, and one of the scams Holmes tried to pull off was a horse theft. But this did not go quite to plan, and it wasn't long before he had to flee Texas before the police could charge them with a crime. Once again, explaining to Georgina with pure fabrications as to why they were leaving in such a rush, and once again, she bought it. Over the many months, Holmes and Benjamin travelled from city to city looking for the perfect place to pull off the life insurance scam, dragging Georgina with them. But Holmes believed that he was unstoppable, and he wasn't afraid to take on more swindles. Whilst in St. Louis, Holmes once again purchased a pharmacy like he had done so so many years before promising the owner's payment the next month, and then he went about stocking the pharmacy up to the brim with merchandise bought on credit, and then sold it all off to make quite a bit of money. He then made up a bill of sale for the store to a completely fabricated buyer named Brown, and when the creditors came calling, he simply showed them the bill of sale and insisted he was no longer the owner of the store. However, this didn't go to plan, and before Holmes could flee the city, he was arrested for the very first time and placed in jail in 1894 for 10 days. But for Holmes, this was actually a happy twist of fate. You see, whilst in jail, Holmes became quite friendly with a man named Marion Hedgepeth, 
In the year of 1856, on the 14th of April, Marion Hedgepeth was brought into the world and by the age of 15, he had already left home and found work as a cowboy in the Wild West. And by the time he reached his 20th birthday, he had killed a few men, as well as becoming a train robber. The appearance of most of the outlaws of that era are exactly what you may expect from the Old West. A wide-brimmed hat, a dirty shirt worn under a vest, and cowboy chaps worn over dusty jeans. But Marion Hedgepeth was a different breed of outlaw. He liked to dress quite dapper, wearing a bowler hat along with a suit that you would expect to see on a well-kept gentleman, and finished off with polished boots. And he was quite a handsome chap, standing at around 6 feet tall with brown, wavy hair. But despite all this, he was like a wild animal, a stone cold killer, and one of the fastest guns in the West. In 1889, he became part of a deadly gang, including him and three other outlaws, and his own reputation eventually earned the gang the name, the Hedgepeth Four. On the night of November the 30th, 1891, the gang robbed the St. Louis and San Francisco Express train by blowing the side out of it with dynamite and taking $40,000. One day, Holmes had struck up a conversation with Marion and explained his idea to him about swindling the insurance company and faking his friend's death. But to pull off the scam, Holmes would have to put his trust in a lawyer who he could trust with his plan and would accept a cut to make it happen. And Marion just so happened to know a very dodgy lawyer. Holmes agreed to include Marion in the scam and give him a nice payment of $500 if he could provide the name of the lawyer with no moral compass. And so Marion agreed, and they shook in it, and he gave Holmes the name of his lawyer, A. Jephthah Howe. And so after spending 10 days in jail, Holmes left with the name of a lawyer and a new accomplice who would be sat in jail for the foreseeable future, and Holmes had no intention of paying him a penny. A mistake he would live to regret. Before leaving home, a drunk Benjamin told his wife all about the plan and the massive payout they would receive when everything went through. His wife wasn't entirely happy with the whole thing, but she decided to support her husband the best she could. Before he left home, Benjamin once again, very drunk, sat down with his eldest child and proceeded to reassure her that if she saw any pictures of him in the papers in the coming weeks saying that he was dead, she should not worry. Take no mind, everything was just fine. His daughter found this strange to say the least, but she just simply put it down to the drink talking once again. Once in Philadelphia, where the scam would take place, Benjamin set himself up with a fake name, B.F. Perry. Holmes and Benjamin then rented a shop and gave him a fake business to run, an inventions business, a patent dealer. It was in this shop that eventually they would plan to stage an explosion where Holmes would provide a cadaver and plant it in the shop. He would then disfigure the face of the decoy body and pass it off as Benjamin, making it look like he had died in the explosion, and then claim the life insurance. Although this wasn't entirely all of Holmes's plan, he kept certain parts of the plan to himself. Holmes was basically planning every small detail of the scam to a T. He couldn't really rely on Benjamin, who spent most of his days as drunk as a skunk. In fact, Benjamin almost ruined the whole plan after he was supposed to pay the monthly payment of the insurance company, but instead simply drank away the money. Holmes realised this at the very last moment and paid the monthly sum just in time, something that would look very suspicious later on. One day, Holmes returned to the patent shop to see Benjamin, and he found him blind drunk upstairs unconscious. Holmes thought that now was probably the best time to act, and he did just that. Benjamin was already helpless, so it was very easy for Holmes to apply a dose of chloroform. In fact, a very high deadly dose of chloroform, which would ultimately kill Benjamin. This was always Holmes' plan. Why would he go to the bother of finding a suitable dead body when he could simply just kill Benjamin? Holmes then went about setting up the aftermath of the explosion by burning away the features of Ben's face so he wasn't recognisable. And then, when satisfied, he left the building Days passed before the police discovered the dead body, which by this time had already started to decay and become putrid, and the stink was almost unbearable. All evidence at the scene suggested that the man had been killed in an explosion, but there were a few things that just did not sit right with the detectives. One was the way that the body was laid out. It was perfectly neat, and his legs straight. Not how you would expect to find a body that had just been blown across the room. Another suspicious part of the explosion is that it only seemed to affect the man's chest and head, and on the floor lay a pipe and a bottle of flammable red liquid, as well as a burned match, which suggested that the deceased lit his pipe and accidentally ignited the liquid, causing the explosion. But this theory also had holes. The pipe itself was in perfect condition, 
No burn marks or damage at all had been inflicted upon the pipe, and it was placed upright very neatly beside his head. And then there was the autopsy, which uncovered that Mr. B. F. Perry liked a drink. And that was clear by the blackness of his kidneys, but they also found traces of chloroform in his stomach. Quite a lot of chloroform. Back home, Benjamin's very stressed out wife, Carrie, read the papers that a Mr. B. F. Perry had died in an explosion. And she knew that B. F. Perry was in fact Benjamin's fake name, and that it wasn't actually a husband that lay dead in the morgue that it was actually a dead body Holmes had acquired from elsewhere. She had no idea that it was in fact her husband in the morgue dead, and Holmes would keep up this life for quite some time, fooling the poor woman all the way. After all, her own husband did ensure her that everything was going to be okay. A few weeks went by and Carrie began to grow more and more anxious, and the stress was actually making her very ill. As well as all this, the money was starting to run dry, and the children were going hungry and she spent many lonely nights lying in her bed alone at night, wondering just where her husband was. It wasn't long before H.H. H. Holmes turned up on her doorstep, offering her some money to tide her over until her husband's return, and he assured her that everything was going to plan, and soon her and her husband would be reunited. But in order for the plan to go even more smoothly, he coldly insisted that Carrie actually make the children believe that their father was in fact dead, as this would make it that much more believable and probably out of fear that they could all face prison if it all fell through, she did just that. It wasn't long before the life insurance company received a letter from Kerry Pitesell, and this was the next part of the plan, claiming that the man they found with the name B.F. Perry was in fact her husband, Benjamin Pitesell, and he was insured for $10,000. There was just a few things that the insurance company found suspicious. For one, the policy had been taken out less than a year ago. Two, the last payment was made late, but just in time before the accident occurred. And three, why was Benjamin going by the name of B.F. Perry? When it came time to identify the corpse, Holmes decided it should be the second eldest daughter, Alice, who go and identify the body of her father. Holmes was afraid that if Carrie went, she would recognise the body was in fact Benjamin and rule the whole thing. But the children already believed it was her father that lay dead in the morgue. And so Kerry stayed in St. Louis and sent her daughter Alice alone with a strange lawyer named Howe, which she was not too happy about, but Holmes insisted that her daughter was in safe hands. Unknown to Kerry, it was the last time that she would ever see Alice alive. It wasn't long before the insurance company, who were doing their own digging into the case, had discovered that Holmes and Pitesell in fact knew each other quite well. They also discovered that Holmes was in fact the owner of the castle back in Chicago that had been damaged in the fire. And according to the street floor level business owners, Holmes had been gone for almost a year. And it wasn't long before the insurance companies got in touch with Murta Holmes. Holmes's second wife, not his current one that he was currently travelling around with from hotel to hotel. Murta, if you remember, was his second wife and she had contacted him telling him that the insurance company wished to speak to him about his associate Benjamin Pitesell. So far, everything was going to plan. Holmes left his new wife Georgina once again telling her that he had important business to take care of and would return as soon as possible. The insurance company wanted Holmes to identify the body and so Holmes travelled to see the corpse whilst at the same time the crooked lawyer and Alice also did the same. Unfortunately it wasn't as simple as just paying a visit to the morgue. You see the body of Benjamin at this point had actually been buried for quite some time and so it was dug up and placed inside a shed in the cemetery where identification could take place. Although his face was burned beyond recognition, there was also the fact that the body had also started to decay when it was first discovered, but now it had been in the cold ground for some time and the rotting flesh made it even harder to burr. Although there were a few telltale features such as Benjamin's rotting teeth and a growth on the back of his neck and a scar on his calf and a bruised thumb, which made it easy for a devastated Alice and a very calm Holmes to identify the body as that of Benjamin Pitesell. In fact, it was actually Holmes who moved the body around in the coffin for the examiner who found it too much to bear. He simply stood back as Holmes manoeuvred the body, sliced thumbnails and removed all dead flesh to show the identifying features of the corpse. Holmes and his dodgy lawyer had pulled it off. The body was proven to be that of Pitesell and the insurance money would be given very soon, whilst the dodgy lawyer would have to stay in Philadelphia to receive the insurance money. Holmes would once again return to Georgina, feeding her more lies about his false business ventures. Whilst only a few blocks away, 15-year-old Alice was holed up alone inside a hotel room. Holmes had assured Kerry that she would be back in her husband's arms in no time, but they must be careful as to not make the insurance people suspicious. 
so Holmes suggested that he take the two children, Nellie and Howard, to join their sister Alice, and Kerry should follow a little later, and he assured her it wouldn't be long before they were all reunited with her husband, and to make her feel more at ease, Holmes divided the profits of the insurance money out, and out of the 10 grand, Kerry only got $500. The lawyer got some, but Holmes pocketed the rest. In order to leave no witnesses, Holmes had decided to kill the whole remaining family, but before he did so, he decided to move them around from hotel to hotel, including Kerry and the other children, as well as his wife Georgina. Sometimes Kerry would be mere blocks away from her other children and not even know about it. This was a way to make the trail more difficult to follow when he finally decided that they were going to die. And whenever his wife inquired when they would once again settle down, he would simply feed her more lies. And when Kerry asked when she would once again see her children and her husband, he would simply feed her more lies. And whenever the children who spent most of their times locked in a hotel room crying for the mother asked when would they see the mother again, he would simply feed them more lies. As distraught as Carrie was and deeply depressed that her children and her husband, who she believed was still alive, had been away for her for weeks, the children's suffering was somewhat more heartbreaking. They were dressed in the same clothing that they had left home in so long ago, which now resembled rags and Burley kept them warm as the colder weather crept in, and they were kept locked inside numerous hotel rooms slowly going out of their mind with boredom and loneliness and hunger, and they would often occupy their time by writing multiple letters to the mother, letters that Holmes never delivered. Holmes would often be seen escorting three young children about with him who all looked unkept and unclean, which in contrast with how smartly dressed Holmes was, was a strange sight to behold. Eventually, he decided that it was time for one of the children to die and he chose little 10 year old Howard to go first, who was becoming increasingly harder to handle and was missing his mother terribly. He would constantly cry and break down and Holmes would often explain this away by saying the child had behavior issues. But the child's tantrums and crying had become a problem to Holmes and his time was now up. And he simply told his older sisters that he was taking the little boy to stay with a female friend of his who could take care of him until the mother returned. Now I will warn you the next part of this story may be hard for you to stomach. Holmes rented a house, a well shielded house in the middle of nowhere. He had a single bed delivered and a large stove and it was in this house that 10 year old Howard was killed by Holmes. He was chopped up into pieces and burned in the stove and then when Holmes had finished disposing of his small inconvenience, he abandoned the house and left without a trace. And it wasn't long before the two girls would also be discarded in a truly cruel way. Holmes somehow convinced the two girls to climb inside a large trunk. I imagine he told them it was a nice fun little game that they were going to play and then he simply closed the lid locking the girls inside. He then inserted a pipe that was connected to a gas line and turned the tap, allowing the gas to flow into the trunk suffocating young Alice and Nellie. Finally he was now free of the children and now it was the mother's turn who had absolutely no idea what had happened. However, back in Missouri State Penitentiary, Marion Hedgepeth had been following the story of the death of Benjamin Pitesell and had somehow gathered that this was the insurance fraud that Holmes had told him about during his time in prison, and it's entirely possible that if Holmes had kept his part of the deal and paid Marion his $500 for providing Holmes with the name of the crooked lawyer, he may have gotten away with the scam. However, as we know, Holmes did not like to part with his money. He was cunning and untrustworthy and never intended to pay Hedgepeth a dime. And as the saying goes, there is no honour amongst thieves. And Hedgepeth told the authorities all about Holmes's plan to commit insurance fraud. And so Holmes was arrested for fraud, but he was still determined to get away with the crime. And so he did what he did best. He lied. He lied through his teeth. The police wanted to know that if the body was not Benjamin Pitesell, then who was it? And this is where Holmes insisted that the body was actually a cadaver, a decoy, and Benjamin was in fact alive and well and in hiding. The police also asked where the children were and every time he was one step ahead, insisting that the children were alive and well and he would then send them out on wild goose chases trying his best to avoid the consequences at any cost. He could handle being arrested for insurance fraud but murder would mean the end for him. And so he kept up the story that Benjamin was in fact alive and well and the children were just fine with their father. However, after some truly amazing police work by Frank Geyer, a Philadelphia police detective who investigated the case with such skill 
to find the three missing children. He literally combed all known areas that Holmes had visited with his wife from hotel to hotel, asking anyone and everyone what they knew, knocking on doors, talking to hotel staff and estate agents, looking for any trace, any chances that anyone knew who Holmes was and recognised the pictures of the three children he dragged around with him. And eventually, his detective work led him to the bodies of the very decomposed Pycelle girls in the cellar of the Toronto home. The homeowners who now lived in the property were very aware of a strange patch of dirt that was in the cellar, but could never have suspected what was buried underneath their home. The little girl's bodies were so badly decomposed that the scalp and hurt of Alice came away from her skull when they lifted her from the hole. Holmes had also tried to hide the identity of the youngest girl, Nellie, who had clubfoot, and he had done this by hacking off her feet, which were never found. And it wasn't long before Frank was successful in finding the house that Holmes had rented to kill little Howard Pycelling. It was here that he learned that Holmes had purchased drugs from a local store and had also had a surgical tool sharpened to cut up the little boy. Whilst searching up the chimney of the house, Gaia found teeth that were still attached to the jawbone, as well as other bits of bone fragments. And he also found the charred remains of young Howard Pycelle's stomach. These few things were all that remained of the little boy. And of course, when Carrie Pycelle learned that her children were dead, she was beside herself with grief. She suspected for some time that her children and husband may be dead, but to have it revealed as fact proved too much and it absolutely destroyed her. It was felt that even though she knew about the scam from day one, she was nevertheless the victim in the whole thing, and the poor woman had already lost a husband and three children, and so all charges were dropped. She'd suffered enough. When Holmes was made aware that the children's bodies had been found, he simply hatched another cunning lie. He was getting desperate now, claiming that the children had been placed in the safe hands of a purely fabricated duo named Minnie and Hatch, two accomplices he had trusted to look after the children who must have killed them themselves. But if his lies were thin before, they were now transparent. No one believed a word, he said. However, it wouldn't be long before the police investigated the murder castle, and as they walked the bizarre twisted corridors of the vacant property, they could sense that something was off about the building especially in the inclusion of secret sliding walls and chutes that went from the second floor to the basement, and suspicious controls in Holmes's office that seemed to pump gas into selected rooms. And when they reached the basement, it was there that they really saw the reality of the situation, with the dissecting tables, the quickline vats, and of course, the bones. Holmes continued to claim his innocence until it was abundantly clear to him that the dream was over and he had lost. But like most serial killers, he enjoyed telling all about his evil deeds. He even wrote his own memoirs and owned up to the murder of 27 people. Though it has got to be said, he also confessed to the murder of some people who turned out to be very much alive. Holmes could not help but tell lies. And so it makes it hard to know what exact number of victims he claimed over the years. Many claim it was in the hundreds, but ultimately we will never know. And even though Holmes did get some form of pleasure from killing, it is safe to say that his motive was always about money. And to say you can't put a price on somebody's life is obviously a saying that he did not agree with. Holmes was later documented as saying the following. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. On May the 7th, 1896, Holmes was hanged at the Philadelphia County Prison. It is said that he remained calm and collected. The only concern about his imminent death was that his body be buried 10 feet deep and concrete poured over it. He had a fear that the body would be stolen and dissected, which is pretty ironic considering the things he did. As the guard secured the noose around his head, Holmes turned to the man and uttered his last words. Take your time, old man. Don't bungle it. When Holmes dropped, the noose yanked at his neck with a great deal of force, but it did not break and for the next 15 minutes Holmes kicked and twitched and choked to death. And with his final twitch, he left this world behind. In the years that followed, many people believe that Holmes was far too clever a man to simply die at the end of a rope. And some believe that Holmes was such a good con man that he'd simply talked his way out of death, and the body that lay in the coffin was not Holmes at all, but a decoy corpse. In 2017, the grave of H.H. H. Holmes was dug up, and the coffin was opened, and they were shocked to find that the body was still in very good condition. Perhaps this was because of the concrete that was poured on top of the coffin all those years ago. Apparently, there was no denying that the corpse was that of H.H. H. Holmes. His clothes were in good condition, and even his moustache had survived all those years. 
but to positively confirm that this man was Holmes. DNA tests were done on his teeth, which once and for all proved that the body was H.H. Holmes, and the case was finally.